Hi, I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. You know, we've had some outrageously beautiful weather for the past month or so. A little bit of rain, but mostly sunny, fairly warm days. Well, the gardener in me has absolutely been delighted, if a little tired. But another family member has also been delighted by the so far fairly few horizontal rain events, and that's my best bud, Cola. So she's 90 pounds worth of princess and one of the most water-averse labs I've ever known. Just the look on her face when she needs to go out to potty and the rain is pelting down against the slider and the wind is howling and the front yard has turned into a small lake. Well, you get the picture. So today we get to talk about these delightful and funny critters. I am delighted to have Jennifer Alcorn, the Executive Director of the South Coast Humane Society, here as my guest today. And I'm very happy to be here. So thank you. Welcome to the show. (laughs) I can't tell you how long I have wanted to have you on the show. And it just hasn't, for one reason or another, just hasn't, the stars have not aligned. Well, they are now. They are, and I'm so excited. (laughs) I can't help it. I get so excited. So it's pouring down rain today. Raining Cats Cats and and dogs. dogs. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And my dog, so, you know, I went to let her out and I opened the slider and literally she looked at me and shook her head. It's like, oh, she's a Labrador retriever. She's She's supposed to be out in the water. I don't know what to tell you. She does not like. She has trained you well. She has. It's been (laughs) 10 years and she has trained me very well. As it should be. As it should be. (laughs) Yeah, she has never liked water. Not ever. That's weird. (laughs) I know. I know. I got her, I got her one of those swimming pools, you know, those kiddie pools, Uh right? Because I thought, we were having a, a few hot days during the summer, and so I put water in. And I thought, oh, she'll like this, right? No bueno. No bueno. <laughs> and I tried everything. So she, she loves to chase a ball. I mean, she's definitely a retriever in terms of that. So I would throw the ball into the middle of the kiddie pool, right? Okay, Cola, go get it, right? She'd look at the ball and look at you. Exactly. And the ball and like, you. Mom, what what are you doing here? I can't get that. There's water in there. Yeah. So, yeah, dogs are funny. They are. They are. They're one of the best things in life. Oh, I think so, too. I think. How many do you have? Personally? Yeah. Well, currently three. Oh, Jennifer. Just three. Come Just three. on. Um, my female had to put her down this year. Oh, it was sorry. time. Yeah. It was time. And, you know, dogs let us know. And there's, there's, uh, there's times when you're back and forth and then they look at you and they let you know that they're tired yep. and that it's time. So yep. my peachy pie went to heaven this uh, year. And so she was the alpha. Oh. Of, of the pack. And I have three boys. Oh, interesting. So she kind of ruled the roost. And as the pack started changing, I could tell that that time was getting the best of her. And uh, she definitely had some cancer going on. So mm-hmm. we, we put her to rest this last year. And eventually I'll, I'll have another one. But I have three big dogs. So it's a lot. <laughs> so when when you've got dogs in a pack like that, it is the female usually the alpha Does i don't that th- i don't think often? it it it's um i don't think it's i don't think there's any rule i think okay. it's really who emerges as the pack leader okay i really do um i have a i have two dogs from my own shelter mm-hmm. um, one is his name is Jax, and he is an anatolian shepherd siberian husky mix <sighs> which means he's very opinionated <laughs> <laughs> and he he's the pack leader right now. He's about 145 pounds. Oh my god. And when I first started at at the shelter as a volunteer, they had some movement in the population there and one of the folks that was working with this dog who had been turned in as a puppy, a 7-month-old puppy, uh and returned for chasing cats. Uh, he was just shut down and broken. And so the director then asked me, would you work with this dog? Mm -hmm. I said, absolutely. So I sat in the kennel and he told me how unhappy he was with me sitting in his kennel. And what I, what I noticed about the dog was there was another little dog named Brownie. And when she would walk by to go on walks or to go to the outside uh, fenced area, 
he would wag his tail and he would perk up. Hmm. And I told the director, I said, look, I've, I've worked with dogs before. I've done some, some things with some rescues in California. And this dog doesn't need people right now. He needs dogs. Hmm. And he needs to be in a play group with dogs. And back then they didn't play group. When I walked through the shelter, I was told this dog's dog aggressive and this dog's dog aggressive and this dog's dog aggressive. And I just kind of shrugged it off and said, mm. okay, well, I'll just walk dogs. Right. Well, I told her, if you want to save this dog, you'll let me get this dog out with other dogs. So she did. Mm. And that's how the play groups started at South Coast Humane. Oh, I love that. I there, love that. Um, and I model all of my play grouping after a group. It's called Dogs Playing for Life. Uh, Amy Sadler is the founder, and um, it's called Every Dog Every Day. She tours and she goes to different shelters with her staff, and she teaches the staff how to get dogs out, how to watch dog behavior, how to um, predict dogs that aren't going to get together, hmm. um, how to break up fights if necessary. Mm -hmm. And play grouping and understanding if dogs are going to be social, it's very important to know that before they leave the shelter. It's very important. Are you going to have dog skiffs and dog fights? Absolutely. But I'd rather have it at my shelter and know what's behind this dog yeah. and who he gets along with and who she gets along with before I adopt a dog out into the public. So yeah. you can give the best information. What I have found is some female dogs don't get along together because they can be bitchy. <laughs> and I know that's shocking. And shocked, some, yeah. some boys can puff up on each other. But mm -hmm. typically males and females cohabitate pretty, pretty well. Hmm. If a, usually if a boy doesn't like a girl, there's something wrong with that boy. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just what I have seen in, right. in dog behavior. So, but jumping back to, to Jax, um, for two weeks... I'd get him out and he was happy and he'd kind of come up and smell my hand, but didn't want any interaction. Mm -hmm. And then one day I would just literally open up the side door and kind of herd him in every night. Well, one night he decided he didn't want to go back into the kennel. So mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm going to have to get him in the kennel. Mm -hmm. And so I had to, had to grab him to get him into the kennel. And he mouthed me, but he didn't hurt me. He didn't break any skin. He was just afraid. And I thought, God, everything I've done, I've just ruined it all. Mm -hmm. So the next day, we come out onto the dog yard and it's time to go in. And I tell him, kennel, let's go. And he, and he wouldn't, wouldn't go. So he gets to the end of the fence and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to try something. And I gave him a sit and he sat down and he put his big paw up and he put it right in my hand and I was able to take him in. And from that day forward, I walk that dog every day. I would wake up thinking about this dog and he would hear my voice and he would put his hands up on the cement barrier and he'd be looking for me. And I thought to myself, my husband's never going to go for this. <laughs> never. And he didn't. And I got miserable. And then he got miserable. And then he said, I'm just going to say it. He said, go get that goddamn dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I won. And if mama um, ain't happy, ain't that nobody is, that happy. That is correct. Yes. That is yeah. correct. Yeah. So Jax has been with me for almost seven years. Wow. And um, he's he's not the dog that you go up to and put your hand out and mm -hmm. pet him. And I know my dog. I protect my dog. Uh, mm -hmm. My dog stays on a leash when I'm out in the public um, because he's fearful of strangers. Mm -hmm. And that dog that got returned for chasing cats lives happily with two cats. Yeah. And it, my gray kitty from my own shelter, that's his favorite cat. So... I love so, my dogs. Jennifer, let's start at the beginning because, you know, here I we just jumped in, but <laughs> <laughs> and I can't help it, right? But how long have you been with South Coast Humane? About six years. Okay. And to the best of my recollection, recollection <laughs> about six years. Okay. And I started as a dog walker mm -hmm. and then got on the board of directors mm -hmm. and then literally went to the shelter every day because I was just thinking, how do I help these animals get out of their kennels? Um, that was a big deal. Um, when I first came, they, there are double guillotine kennels. So they have a potty side and a bedside. Right. And when they would clean the dogs, they would literally put the dogs on one side, clean the side, then put the dogs on the other side. And that's just, that's no way to live. So, no. um, I got on the board and then I stepped off of the board to run the shelter. Mm -hmm. We redid the dog yards so that they are secure fencing. 
Well, with double sided, so we have holding kennels before you go in. Ooh. Our dogs play group all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're not play grouping, they're on dog walks. I get there very early every morning. Um, I'm just one of those people that says those dogs need to have that, you know, stimulation mentally. Right. And we'll talk about cats too. So don't yeah, yeah, think yeah. it's all about the dogs, but you know, dogs dogs can go kennel crazy, and that's when they start having behaviors that we don't like to see. Um, so we try to do the best to enrich their lives. So all day they are basically in and out of the kennel, something? Yeah, doing wow. something all day long. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. very different from the way it was. We have 40 dog kennels. All of our dogs have a, have a dog that they play group with or that they can co-kennel with. And we see that when dogs co-kennel, mm-hmm. um, they're happier. Mm-hmm. You know, they have somebody that they can roughhouse with. I don't know if you saw the video. I have, um, I had uh, two little pity mixes, and they were just wrestling and rut and then growling and rut. And I walked over and I go, "What are you two doing?" And they looked at me and they're just so happy because <laughs> they have a friend to play with. Yeah, dogs are social creatures. Yep. And you know, it's it's kind of like the prison system. If you want to make a man mad, put him in jail. You want to make him crazy, put him in isolation. Mm, and when yeah. you isolate, you start seeing those behaviors. Right. And I'll kind of go back just a little bit. Um, There was a dog there when I first started. His name was Jack. And we had a really nice dog walker. He'd walk him every single day. We had double doors in the back. And I was out on the dog yard and Jack had gone for a walk. And he was one of those dogs. They told me this dog is dog aggressive because every time you take him out on a leash, he's just mad. Hmm. Right. I was out on the backyard with a director at the time and the back doors pop open. We had two or three dogs out there and Jack is standing there and he's erect and he's looking around and the tip of his tail is starting to wag. And the director was like, Oh my God, you know, he's going to go after the smallest dog. I'm like, just wait. And he went over and he started wagging his tail and playing. And I looked at her and I said, I really want to see his file. So I went back to his file and I said, if I'm going to work with these dogs, I want to see what their files say. He was surrendered because his owner passed away three years ago. He'd been there for three years. He had been good with kids, cats, dogs, everybody. And he'd been isolated. So all that barking and growling was frustration. The dog walker that had walked him for quite some time adopted him, took him home, gave him a great, great life. He ended up dying of cancer about a year later. Yeah. But at least... He got to be understood. Yep. And we got him into a home. Yep. yep. It's, it's really important to get as much information about the background as you can. A lot of times we have to piece it together. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, all they had to do is look and see that he, he just wanted to be with other animals and, and be social and be understood. And sometimes that's what you need to do is just watch them. Right. Right. Just, oh, absolutely. just watch their behavior and, yeah. and because they're telling you mm-hmm. what they like and what they don't like. Absolutely. If they're afraid or not. Well, and it's, it's interesting what you say about what that they like. Um, my staff now, we, we go through and it's an online class, but it's called Fear Free Shelter. Mm-hmm. And it is a, 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 a program. And it's several modules and it goes over animal behavior for cats and for dogs. And so we are fear free certified because we want to provide a fear free shelter environment for animals. So fear free means that you are doing whatever you can to not have the animals experiencing. Correct. Correct. Fear. And we are also we're also looking at their behaviors and not putting them in a position to act out. Mm -hmm. So instead of taking, for instance, in our intake room, we have cat kennels. Instead of just sticking that cat in an open kennel with a basic floor mat, like something that you would see in our cattery because those cats are out free. Right. We provide hide boxes because a cat comes into the shelter. They don't know what's going on around them. Right. Um, All these new sights, sounds, and they're, 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 um, I want to say they're uh, ocular and um, just trying to think their their smell yes everything that they smell all that stuff comes into play into their fear response so we give them hide boxes so it allows them to hide so they're not feeling like everything's coming down on them Um, that's something that's really important for cats i mean you can actually you know think about it if you were a child a Mm -hmm. five-year-old for instance that was just 
pushed into kindergarten, you right. might actually want a place to hide for a while Absolutely. until you kind of sussed everything out. A little out. bit of safe space. Yeah. And, you know, you'll know right away when you provide a hide box. If a cat goes directly into a hide box, it's it's afraid. Mm -hmm. If it stays out and it, you know, gives it the tail wag and it doesn't right. want to go. Of course, that's maybe a, a cat that's a little more accustomed to uh, different environments and is right. a little more social. Right. And cats that go in and hide, we don't want to force them to come out and interact. We want them to come out on their own. Right. It's an interesting thing. You know, human beings kind of think that we're the top of the, you know, food chain. <laughs> and, we, and we treat other creatures like they are not intelligent creatures, that oh. they don't have a Animals way. Animals are very intelligent. I know. I know. It's amazing to me. Absolutely. And it's amazing how we think that they don't, what they want doesn't matter. It just, it just makes me crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, not at, not at our shelter. We, we try to accommodate each animal that comes into our, our shelter. And as animals come in, as a, as a shelter director, it's very important to have a plan, an exit plan. It's not that we want to just, oh, we're a shelter. We're going to shelter this animal for the rest of its life. That's an injustice mm -hmm. to the animal. Sure. And each animal, based upon their unique set of circumstances, we want an exit plan. So we want to enrich them. We want to provide the right stimulation and put them in the best place to succeed to get a potential adopter and, and make it a good adoption. And you do something that, um, that I had not ever really heard about before, which is that you let people foster. Oh, yeah. Which, I mean, when I got my dog, she was, well, when I first saw her, she was five weeks old and she was in a, a kennel with her brother and sister and they had been turned in mm -hmm. at five weeks. I mean, that's way too soon anyway, but um, th the shelter kept her until she was three months old rather than let and I thought at the time, that's just not... Well, and we, we talk about this a little bit before we got on air. They, they miss a lot of what they need to grow and to bond. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a formidable stage there, and they're missing a lot of that, especially if they're kenneled. Yeah. So we do what's called a foster to adopt. Um, and then we also just have fosters. I have um, some permanent fosters for animals that maybe have some long-term medical issues mm -hmm. that would steer someone away from for financial reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in a very good financial position to help animals like that, um, due mainly in part to the board that was here previously, the management of the money, um, our thrift store sales, which fuels everything for South Coast Humane Society, in addition to donations and, right. you know, adoptions and such. Uh, but our adoption fee doesn't even cover half of what we put into each animal medically. Yeah. And that should tell you, uh, and I knock on, we said don't knock on anything in the, in the sound room, but <laughs> Please knock don't. on, <laughs> knock on foam here. Yeah. Um, I won't, I won't raise the adoption fee. Um, we want to move animals out of the shelter. We want to give people a reasonable rate to, to get a forever family member. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. That's... So how many animals do you currently have in the shelter? Oh, currently I have about 48 dogs. Okay. I have 40 kennels, but like I said, we co-kennel animals. Mm -hmm. But I do have some dogs that are currently in foster. I have a mom with some puppies. Mm -hmm. I have a female shepherd that is in foster. Um, she's waiting for an adopter mm -hmm. uh, that we've been communicating with. It's a beautiful adoption. I do have... Oh God, there's, there's so many moving parts to our shelter now that it's, it's not that. even funny. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so in addition to, to local help and taking in local dogs, I have a local dog that was just surrendered, but we were able to get it into a good foster here. So it doesn't have to be in the shelter Oh, good. because it's scary. Yeah. So what they did was they came in, they surrendered the dog. We vaccinated, flea treated, dewormed, microchipped. So it's ready to be fixed. Mm -hmm. That dog is on my schedule for next week. Mm -hmm. So we take pictures, we get it up on our website. We get potential adopter, adopters excited about it. And if we can get that dog adopted from the foster home, man, we've saved that dog a lot of stress. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's why fostering is important. Cat fostering is very important because... Now, why is that? Well, kittens are very fragile. 
Yeah. And upper respiratory infections in cats in shelters is horrible. Wow. And the reason it's horrible because say one cat starts sneezing in one room and you're cleaning. And even though you can have immaculate cleaning, that stuff travels. Yeah. And then the kittens get it. And then you've got a litter of six kittens that are sneezing. And then it goes to, I mean, so you can literally be spending hours medicating animals. So that's why cat fosters, we have several families from Crescent City all the way up to Coos Bay that have a, have fostered a litter of kittens wow. until they're six to eight weeks old. They've had a series of vaccinations on board. Mm -hmm. So that gives them less susceptibility to that upper respiratory infection. Something else that we do as a shelter, if you take a foster to adopt kitten home and it starts sneezing or you've got an upper respiratory, we're going to treat that cat for you. We're not going to leave you high and dry until you go to the vet. Right. Um, we, we take care of our vets, our, our adopters. So that's something that we, I'm very proud of too. Yeah, good. So we were talking about how many. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Okay, so. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. I mean, there is. <laughs> cat, the yeah. cattery has 22 adult cats right now. Mm -hmm. All very friendly, except for one that's a little bit scary and shy. Uh, I have an overflow of black cats, and they are the nicest black cats ever. Isn't I mean, that just weird, the way it, people don't want to take black dogs and cats? That's, it, I, it is, but it. you know what? It seems like for just as many people that, you know, they don't want a black cat. I mean, I've got people that are crazy about the black cats yeah. and, and black dogs. Yep. So, you know, I think it's just, it's just yeah. what, do, what do people want? Yeah. Um, my main meet and greet room, which is behind my front desk, I only have seven kittens in there right now. Hmm. A couple of them are fixed. A couple will get fixed this week. So our, our population's almost 100% altered right now, which uh, that's something to be proud of. Yep. My kitten room, which is kind of my quasi adult cat room right now, um, I have to negotiate my population to accommodate the a number of animals. Uh, I have some nice teenage cats and some young mother cats that are getting fixed that have mm -hmm. their adult babies with them that have been turned in recently. And then my intake had nothing in it for almost a week. Wow. So I shouldn't have held my breath very long <laughs> because we had, I call them the Dairy Queen litter. Uh, we had a mama with two kittens that were brought in and then two more that were found very close to Dairy Queen. They all look almost identical. So I can almost wow. bet that it's the same litter. Right. A cute little things. Yeah. Um, my UPS guy brought me three kittens today. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. UPS guy. And then I had, this is kind of a sad one. Uh, we had a semi-feral kitty up on the North Branch. Well, I shouldn't say semi. She was really feral. <laughs> yeah. She came in and she was super, super, super pregnant. Mm -hmm. Put her into foster uh, with my special foster, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. And um, she had kittens. And they were about three and a half, four weeks old. And then she started doing some things in mother nature that sometimes happened. She ate one of her kittens. Mm -hmm. And so we pulled them immediately, mm -hmm. got her fixed, got her ear trimmed, returned her back to where she came from because she was really not handleable. Mm -hmm. So as the kittens started to develop, we started to see some, some disabilities in the kittens in their spine, oh, which is probably what why? Mama Cat was doing. Yeah. So we're going to have to... We're, we're looking into some treatment. Um, one of them can't really use the back legs, so we're going to have to really right. see if we can find somebody special. Right, um, right. They're friendly little kittens, but they've definitely got some genetic issues going on. Isn't that interesting that the mother would know that? Well, you know, moms do know. Yeah. Mom, moms know. That's just amazing. Mother nature. So how many animals typically go through the shelter like in a year or so? So this is where we, we currently sit. And I, and I wrote these numbers down because I wouldn't remember them. This year to date, uh, I have taken in 421 local cats <laughs> and 196 local dogs for 617. Wow. So that's half of the number. Then I've transferred in needy animals from high population shelters. I don't like to call them high kill shelters even though that's kind of what it comes down to, many of the shelters are so overpopulated now. Um, and, you know, people say, oh, my God, they're euthanizing and euthanizing. And the sh shelters don't want to euthanize animals. Right, right. But what do you do when the population is so high? You know, there's only so many fosters that you can have. And, and so, unfortunately, 
you know, some of the shelters are high kill shelters. So I've taken in 127 cats or kittens and 628 dogs for 755. So our total (laughs) intake this year is 1,372 and we have about 30 days left. That's an enormous number. But what's really cool is we've adopted 409 cats and 900 dogs. Oh, wow. So that is 1,309. Wow. Out of 1,372 intake. So, you know, I bust my rump every day. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was raised in the country. I, I'm, that's one thing I'm not a, a stranger to is working hard every day. Yep. I go to bed thinking about my animals. I wake up thinking about my animals and I think about my animals all day long. And until I can get them into a home, um, we just work hard to do that. So what's a typical day look like for you? <laughs> well, before you're in up my, before in, the sun in my past life, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I used to get up at three forty seven every morning because in I ran an morning. outdoor fitness boot camp. Oh my God. And um, I would I would slam a French press of coffee. I would make my game plan, and then I had a trailer with all of homemade equipment that I made. Wow. And then I had between forty and eighty people, five a.m. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then I had evening boot camps, and then, anyway, I trained people for a living. Training animals is easier. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure. (laughs) So my my time clock, when we moved moved to Oregon, I was able to sleep in till like six, and then it's weird, I kind of slowly started going back to my boot camp time. So now I wake up about four-ish, usually never past 4.30. I get up, I get on the computer, Um, I've got, well... Of course, we do three rounds of dog treats first. While I'm making my French press, my dogs get their three rounds. Three rounds. Three rounds. Of, I love this. Three, they get three rounds of dog treats. They get a salmon treat. They get a crunchy treat. <laughs> and then another chewy treat. Is there a reason why they have three rounds of treats? Well, one is, is there just, a philosophy behind this? Well, we don't want to eat too much. We don't want our dogs to be fat. Okay. Because then it's going to cause arthritis and okay. such. And one is not enough. Four is too many. So we just we just three. Okay. And I like the crunch. They eat. They finish with the crunchy one. I don't okay. know why. Okay. <laughs> so they don't eat breakfast per se. No, I, okay. I feed. I feed my my personal dogs. I feed once a day, and I feed them in the evening when I get okay. home. Okay. Okay. So. Um, then they get to go take a bathroom break, and then they come in, and typically my cat, Marlene, uh, she's a, a bobtail calico, she'll come and lay on my feet while I'm doing my computer work. You know, any bills that I have to pay for the shelter, any orders that I have to do, um, emails for adopters, appointments, um, schedules for spay and neuter, and then, of course, you know, you'll see my Facebook post just about every morning. I try to get fresh things up so people can be thinking about what we have available. Yep how they can help. And then I'm at the shelter about six. Mm. Um, and that's on a typical day. If we have spay and neuter and I'm sending cats up to snipped, I'm at the shelter at four because I'm packaging up animals, getting paperwork ready, getting them up to Coos Bay. If we have a spay and neuter clinic at our shelter, I'm there at 530 mm. and we have to get the animals clean, get our kennels set up because that's where we stow the animals while they're waiting to go into surgery. Uh, mm. We do do surgery Uh, Once a month, we do a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I've been able to scale my intake down just a little bit so I don't have as many animals in my shelter to spay and neuter, and I've been able to offer some lower cost options for the public, which I'm really happy to do because it's hard to get into the vet. Trying to get into a vet is like, holy Mm -hmm. moly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, town and country's inundated. Dr. Tribble's inundated. Yeah. Um, I, Dr. Barkey up in Gold Beach. They've got the town and country satellite up there. And then, of course, all creatures, Crescent City Animal right. Hospital and right. Four Paws. You know, those are the ones that jump out to me. Right. And when I tell people, um, if you're adopting, get on a waiting list, yep. get established. Yep. We can always offer very low cost vaccinations on a yearly basis, but you got to have a vet in case you have an emergency. Yep. Yep. And my understanding right now is we don't have a lot of emergency options here. Mm-mm. The closest is Medford. Oof, oof. Central Point. Yeah, and, Central and Point. we do have actual emergencies here. I mean, oh, my, we do. My dog got do. sprayed 
and mm. not not this dog, but a, a previous yellow lab had gotten sprayed. She was this close, like literally within a foot of a mm-hmm. skunk when it unleashed itself, mm-hmm. right? And and her eyes are like running and closed. And it was like, I'm calling the vet at six o'clock in the morning on a right. Sunday morning, but somebody better help because something's, you know. Yeah. And at that point, I could get in to see an emergency vet. But yeah. we do have those yeah. kinds of things happen. We have lots of emergencies here. I mean, even though we're a small community, we still have the need for emergency yep. medical for animals. Yep. And it it feels like it it happened during COVID. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happened during COVID, but yeah. but it was like the, suddenly you couldn't get into to the vet. I mean, the dental appointments were six months out. Yep. Which is... Well, yeah. in spay and neuter itself, you know, I know that everybody's booking about three months ahead, mm, mm-hmm. at least, mm-hmm. at least three months ahead. Wow. So that's, wow. that's a hard one. Yep. So you're you're at the shelter by six ish, and mm-hmm. then what's your day? Oh, so it's kind of a hurricane. I <laughs> it's a hurricane. Um, I go through the intake. I we call it the intake side, but we don't really have an intake side anymore. Um, our population is super healthy. Uh, I will go through, and I have four dog yards, and so my twenty kennels, which has anywhere from twenty to twenty four dogs in them. I will take those dogs and plug them into the side yards and the backyards so they get to go out and go potty break. Mm -hmm. Um, Those dogs all get along with each other. Um, Those I did some real good renovations, like I said, with the with the side doors. We have um, security screen doors, so there's good ventilation and flow, and you can hear everything that's going on outside. I have cameras with all on all my yards, and then it's a matter of stripping all the kennels down, um, scraping. Uh, everything that's in there. Our dogs are pretty, pretty clean right now. Mm. We have a lot of dogs that are definitely housebroken. Mm. And because we get there early and we stay till about 6.30-ish, now our dogs get that bathroom break after they eat dinner too. Nice. Yeah, it is nice. It makes a difference. So, so yeah. one side will get in, get out and then they come in, they eat breakfast while we get the other side out and clean the other side. And then uh, as employees come in, my employees come in a little bit earlier than they used to. They come in at 7.30. I'll typically be up at the front. I'll have a quick briefing on what's going on, where we stand, who needs to go to what room. Everybody knows what our cleaning protocols are. And then we all end up in the laundry room. That's where everything really ends up and happens. And our dogs are usually bedded back down by 10 o'clock. Everybody's had breakfast. Wow. I like to have lights out so that they have a little bit of downtime after they go out, have their body, bathroom break, and eat. Okay. Um, they'll get toys. Mm-hmm. We have an Alexa back there with classical music Aww. or um, reggae. They love reggae. Wow. So, you know, I like Indian flute music as well, and yeah. the dogs like it. And so we go lights out, and they have two hours of quiet time. <sighs> And then when we come back, we'll get the intake out again, and then the opposite side, we'll get to go on dog walks, and then we rotate. Wow. So about every two hours, we rotate so that they are not just sitting in kennels. Right. You know, I hate that. I, yeah. hate, think- yeah. I hate thinking of a dog just sitting there on a, on a cold corunda. We have beautiful blankets, tons mm-hmm. of donations. Mm-hmm. People donate. Um, we have interactive dog toys. We have chewy treats. We're not, I'm not big on rawhide because that can cause some intestinal stuff. Right, so we right. do the natural chews that, you know, aren't going to ball up in, in their tummies. Yep. Uh, but we don't, we don't uh, try not to overfeed them <laughs> because they don't get a ton of exercise right. and activity. But you probably didn't know this. So one of my goals was to get an off-site area to decompress the animals that had grass because all of our... All of our stuff is cement. Yeah. And when we get dogs that maybe have been surrendered, that have, you know, lived inside all the time, you'll you'll see these dogs limping and you're like, oh my God, what happened? Mm -hmm. Well, when they, when they're out on the cement and they haven't been accustomed to it, Mm -hmm. their pads get worn down. Mm -hmm. And so they get soft pads, Mm -hmm. pillow pillow pads, we call them. And, you know, that can be, that can be hurtful and stressful because then they have to not go out for walks because their feet hurt. Right. Well. We bought property well. this last year. Uh-huh. We bought property uh, 10 acres up on 
um, off of Dooley Creek Road, Taylor oh, Creek Road. Nice. And there is, uh, I've been working up there in all my spare time. <laughs> Um, clearing sounds like you've got a lot of that, clearing st- <laughs> but it forces me to get out of there. Yeah. And so there's a home up there. There are, um, there's about four areas that we are going to fence mm. and it's not because we want to bring in more animals. It's not that we are trying to warehouse animals. It's when we have two dogs that need to get out of there and get a break, they get to go up to the yard for a week. I can video, mm. I can picture I can take potential adopters up there. They can Mm -hmm. see them in a home type environment. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been taking them up, even though I don't have the fences up yet, we're, we're working on getting fencing up. I do have tie outs. So while I'm trimming and clearing stuff, the dogs get to play and they get to be dogs. And it's really cool. Um, You may have seen some of the pictures from the ranch. Yeah, I did. I saw a couple of them and I'm thinking, it's grass. "Hmm." Yeah. Yeah. And, and once it, my goal is to make that, like a park so that volunteers can go up during the day and they can couple take a dog off of the off the ranch and go down mm-hmm. to the creek there oh. and um, spend some good quality time in an environment where they don't have to have them on a leash they can be in a fenced yard with yeah. grass yeah and play and be animals yes. yeah yep. exactly mm-hmm. so how many volunteers do you have or well, staff or so, staff and volunteers We do. We have to have a paid staff. I mean, and I'll just I'll just say this. It even though we are an animal shelter, it is a business. And if it's not run properly, um, you know, the animals suffer. So we do we do have and I'll start with my thrift store, the thrift store, major funding source for the shelter. Donna Nielsen, she's my manager over there and she is priceless. I love Donna. (laughs) I love the thrift store. Don, I, you know, when COVID happened, I went in there and just, just destroyed everything, <laughs> took walls down, painted. <laughs> um, Donna has been working on getting flooring done there. So we're taking out the, some of the carpet. Mm-hmm. So we're, our goal is to keep it as clean and as fresh as possible. And I know that when I used to spend time over there before I had Donna, um, I would think, God, you know, We're going to run out of donations. Oh, my God. You never, ever, ever run out. Just when you think you're out of donations, that truck comes in, and then you're like, what treasures are in here? (laughs) And where are we going to put it all? (laughs) Thrift stores are freaking awesome. I mean, you can find some really cool stuff over there, and it's just you never know what day it's going to be. Yep. And I told Donna, I go, you know what? We're the biggest garage sale on the South Coast, and everything's for sale, and you wheel and deal. And if somebody wants something, you make them the best deal you can make it. <laughs> and and she does. Yeah, and she moves great. moves stuff quick. Um, clothing is our biggest seller. Yeah. And with the economy the way it is, it's nice to be able to say, hey, we're doing 50% off of everything in the store, and she does it frequently, and yeah. we move stuff. She has... Frankly, uh, that's how I, I clothe myself. I mean, it, it has been for years. It's good stuff. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's good is. stuff. Yeah. You know what? I mean, yep. seriously. Yep. And we offer um, senior um, discount and mm-hmm. veteran discount every day. Nice. And I mean, when I was running my own boot camp, I was one of those people. It was a it was a discount boot camp. I did an honor system. Mm. It was $3. Hmm. And I had a bag. And you just put $3 in the bag. If you're a cancer survivor or a veteran, it was always free. Wow. You know, wow. be around good people, support yourself, yep. surround yourself yep. with good people. Good things yep. happen. Yeah. So Donna has 11 employees. She has okay. eight, uh, eight part-time and three full-time, including herself, which she works more than full-time. Of course. She's priceless. Um, myself, I have three full-time and three part-time and then myself. Mm-hmm. And so we are, we're always looking for good hands. We're always looking for people that can handle animals um, well, especially dogs. Right. Cats seem to be a lot easier for people to handle. Mm-hmm. Uh, but having good common sense with dogs is very important because yep. you can't make mistakes. No. You know, no. it puts puts the animals at risk and it puts you at risk if you're you're not having good common sense with them. So you've got volunteers who come in and, mm-hmm. and walk dogs. Yes. And... Our main, our main, I've got. I've got a couple of really great cat ladies that come in. They groom the cats. They work with the cats that are a little bit fearful. Um, Trish comes in nonstop. I have a great foster, and she's actually on the board. Her name is Carrie. She's kind of my neonatal specialist for kit cats and kittens, mm-hmm. and she'll take small puppies and small families. Mm-hmm. Um, she's constantly got stuff. If if someone's calling me and telling me they found a two-day-old kitten, I'm on the phone with Carrie, and yeah. she's... 
yeah. down there. We've got her set up with an incubator, mm. um, a nebulizer, mm. uh, oxygen, so that if we have a cat that's struggling, I mean, she's about as close to the to the vet yeah. 24-hour care as we can get. Excellent. Uh, we have great protocols uh, written by um, multiple vets mm-hmm. that we put together. So when we see certain things in the shelter, we're able to provide the right medical for them. Um, getting back to the volunteers, though, we have a, a revolving door of dog walkers. I have people that follow our Facebook from San Francisco, and they travel up here and they walk dogs when they're here. Wow. Um, so it's that's pretty cool. Yes, it is. Um, when people see on Facebook and they're like, wow, we want to come to that shelter and meet you and, 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 and walk your dogs and see what you do. And it's, it's pretty excellent. cool. It's yeah. really cool. Yeah. I thought I was going to move move up here and just kind of be a low-key kind of gal. Yeah. It didn't work out like that, but... Yeah. You thought you were <laughs> going to retire, didn't you? I did. Yeah, that's what I thought when I moved here, too. Right. It doesn't happen. No, when you work, you work. <laughs> I know. Yeah, you're it's always just, going to. Yeah, it's the way it is. It just is. Well, so let's talk a little bit about this respiratory disease that... Okay. Because that, obviously, as a dog parent, mm-hmm. I'm I'm concerned about that. Right. It is in the news right now, mainly because there have been a couple of rescues that are pretty high profile that have seen a couple of these cases come through their rescues, and they're on Facebook a lot. And so the attention now is is kind of mounted. This disease has kind of been going through these areas for the last couple of years. Really? Um, uh, I want to say about two years ago, you know, we do a lot of pull from high kill shelters. And mm-hmm. the way that that works is... If you're a 501c3 and there is a dog that's at risk, you can be asked to take a dog in. Mm -hmm. Um, We typically will get a dog in foster in California to make sure that it's healthy and happy. Sometimes you can't do that. You got to get them straight here. Mm -hmm. So we have seen a lot of kennel cough um, Mm -hmm. in our shelter because we'll get them here. They look healthy. And then three days later, they're coughing. Yep. We treat it. About a couple years ago, we saw um, a couple of dogs that got that bacterial pneumonia. Mm-hmm. So what we did was we did a culture and we found out that mycoplasma, which is similar to Bordetella, but it's a different strain of kennel cough, which mm-hmm. we don't typically see up here. We see it in California shelters. That was being touched with a little bit of what's called strep zo. Okay. Strep zoo, strep zo. I always pronounce it wrong. And that's a zoonautical bacteria. Okay. And it metastasized to a bacterial pneumonia. Oh. And if you didn't know that the dog had it and it wasn't treated progressively, they could literally drown from pneumonia. Oh. So oh. we learned that. Yeah. We wow. learned that with a couple of dogs that we had from California. Wow. So I, I'm not sure that that is the strain, mm-hmm. but it sounds very similar to mm-hmm. what I hear is going around now. And there's a lot of publicity. What can you do as a dog owner to safeguard your animal, Yeah, keep it up to date on all the vaccinations, mm-hmm. the distemper, leptoparvo, the bordetella, and then the canine influenza. Didn't ever know about the canine influenza. Yes. Uh, canine flu. Um, it, it can happen. We haven't seen it here, uh, but it can happen. Um, so we carry that vaccination at our shelter and I'm offering a special on it. It's 15 bucks. We were charging 25. I think the vet Charges a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can get into the vet. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Bordetella, I'm doing a special for $10. And Distemper Leptoparvo, I'm doing a $5 special. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I mean, you can li- literally get it all done for 30 bucks. And are you doing that on a particular day? At a Monday particular... through Saturday, 2 to 4. You don't okay. have to bring your animal into the shelter. You come oh. in, fill out a form. We'll co- take it out to the car. Okay. And then you have them up to date. Okay. Um, the flu vaccination, it does require, if it's the first vaccination, it requires a booster in six weeks, regardless of the age of the animal. Mm-hmm. And then it's good for uh, good for a year. Okay. And then it's a yearly booster, just like your typical vaccinations. Okay. Uh, another thing that you can do to safeguard is don't visit dog parks mm-hmm. and let your dog drink out of communal water. Ah. You know, if you have a, a group of animals that you've, you know, walked with, like, I'll give you an example. Um, our dog walking group, and I can never remember that. Rip? I think it's yeah, Rip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Rip um, came in and talked with me um, just this last week. And, you know, all those dogs meet 
every week. Right. They've, they're all up to date. Um, it's a known, a known group of dogs. Right. That's different. Mm -hmm. It's when you're communicating with different dogs that you don't know anything about dog grouping, dog play grouping, right. you know, you're traveling and you like, for instance, I'll just use this as an example. And on the way to the rogue river, there's a nice, um, rest stop and there's a dog park that you can let your dog out to go to the bathroom. Okay. Lots of people go there. Okay. That's the place you don't want to go. Right. Because, <laughs> right. you know, there's... Because the germs or mm -hmm. the bacteria or whatever... You don't know who's right. been there and who's not been there. Right. So. so so, can my dog pick it up if there's no other dog there? I mean, just by sniffing around in the they grass? Can. They yeah. could. Wow. They could. Wow. And more than likely out of, like, the water. Mm -hmm. Like, if there's that okay. communal water bowl. Right. That's right. where a lot of things get transferred is communal water bowls. Now, some of us have family coming down for the holidays. Mm -hmm. Some of our family have a dog that they're bringing. Mm -hmm. What are there precautions that we should take? I mean... If their dogs are all up to date on the vaccinations mm -hmm. as well, should be relatively safe. Okay. Should be safe. Okay. okay. But, you know, everybody should be cognizant of the dog parking. I'm not a big fan of dog parks myself. I'm just not because you don't know if... The no. person that's bringing their dog is as responsible as you. Well, and you don't know the dogs. Right. And that's in, in regards to not only vaccination history, but behaviors. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I hate when people go to a dog park with a dog toy and start throwing a ball. Yeah. Because there might be another dog that really likes to play ball and then you've got a dog fight. Yeah, exactly. You know, if, exactly. if you have a group of people, like I said, that y'all know each other. I know there's, there's like a Scotty group here. Mm. They all meet. <laughs> How cute. And, you know, <laughs> but you can always meet in, in your friend's backyard, too. Yeah, yeah. you got a backyard. Yeah. Um, that's probably the safer route. So in terms of dogs socializing, I mean, my dog doesn't very much. I mean, very seldom does she, is she around other dogs. Is it, should she be? I mean, is well, that... Well, how important some... is it to you that your dog is social with other dogs? It's not at all important. Then it's not important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's and that's the thing, you know, like my dog, Jax, he's not a social guy. You yeah. know, if you're not part of our family, you're not part of our family. And, yeah. and it, that's not important. It's not important for me to force that dog to be in a social situation where he's uncomfortable, where he could act out. Right. Because I know who he is. Right. right. And if you if if your dog is your dog and and yeah, you're she'd out, mother, much rather be with me than anybody fine. else. In, and, yeah. you know, as long as, as say, for instance, um, if you have a dog that is reactive on a dog on a leash, you know, that might be a dog that you might want to work on some of those social right. things with. Right. But there are times when they're maybe past that point where, you know, you've got a four or five year old dog and it's aggressive on a leash to other dogs. You kind of got to protect that dog from itself at that point. Right. Right. Yeah. And and my dog's not aggressive, but but she's definitely she's a scaredy cat. She well, doesn't really yeah. recognize that she's 90 pounds and, you know, I mean, really, who's going to mess with her, right? But when, when she goes out into the yard, like, she'll, she'll gallop out into the yard barking because she's sure that there's something out in the yard. I don't know, a bird? <laughs> I mean, something is of like... Of course. Something's in her space. That's so, okay. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's bizarre. <laughs> it's just bizarre. So, Jennifer, what do you need in terms of stuff? Like, do you need more volunteers? Do you need blankets? Do you need dog we food? Could, we can always use blankets. Mm -hmm. Always use blankets. Um, you know, if you've got a closet full of blankets that have been sitting there that you're not using, we can use them because dog, we go through them a lot. You know, you get a dog that is bored and shreds blankets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it yeah. happens. Yeah. So we do, we do go through a lot of blankets. Dog walkers. I can use dog walkers, dog walkers, dog walkers. We, we love, I, I like to save the cleaning for the staff because we're covered and I want my volunteers to be able to interact with animals. You can sit in our break room with shy dogs. You can socialize with puppies. You can bring the kids down and we got little fishing poles for kitties you know, the kittens love it. The cat, the kids, the kitties love it. The kitties and yeah. the kitties love it. <laughs> uh, we don't, and I hate to ask for stuff that we don't need. Um, we are, we are doing very well. We are very lucky um, to have what we have. 
Uh, but we can, you know, we can always use bleach, mm-hmm. paper towels, mm-hmm. you know, just cleaning items, things like that. But more importantly, just just manpower. And once we get up to the ranch, you know, definitely have people that I want to have little garden areas where you can come and actually garden in oh. the yard with the animals. Oh. So that's that's fun stuff. Yeah. Because that's when you can actually, you know, you can get stuff and you can give it back to the community, yep. you know, community garden type stuff. Yep. Yep. Things like that. Yep. You know, shy little dogs, scared little dogs. We'll probably have a little scared shy dog group up there where they can, you know, you get a couple people piddling around doing some yard work and gardening where you're out in the sun and those dogs start to realize that it's okay to be around people. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's the fun stuff is the socializing. No. Dog toys. Yeah. What kind of toys do do you need? Oh, we like squeaky toys. (laughs) We like squeaky toys. God, they're so annoying though. Oh, they're great. (laughs) So what I like to do with the squeaky toys, I like to get all new squeaky toys. And at the end of the night, I like to go and distribute the squeaky toys when the lights are out. And then I sit there for about 30 minutes and I listen to the dogs and I listen to them squeaking. And it's fun. That's because then you know that they're like, this is cool. Yeah. Sometimes I think some of the dogs have never had a toy before. And that's sad. That's kind of sad. You know, it's like a kid that's never had a toy. No, I know. I know. You must see some really awful stuff in terms of yeah. some of the history that yeah. the animals um, have. Yeah, you know, I see I see a lot of interesting things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there there can be some some thing, and then I've seen people that have come in that needed help, you know, mm-hmm. with an animal that you know has had some medical issues, mm-hmm. and we do our best to help them. And if I can't help them, then I I help them get to the vet. Uh, because our vets will work with me a lot of times, even if they are booked, they'll they'll see dogs and and that's cats great. for me. That's great, and that's important. You know, I've got a lot of a lot of senior people on very fixed incomes, mm-hmm. and I just had a had a had a gal with a with a dog that has diabetes, and if I can't help her, who yeah, who's going to help her? That's right. We have an angel fund mm. um, that was started from this this lady that. Um, I, I kind of smile because she she blew in like Mary Poppins. I mean, she looked like Mary Poppins. She was perfect. Did she have an umbrella? She was amazing. Her and her husband flew in from Colorado. They moved here. And she adopted this dog that had this horrible skin. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were fixing it. But she said, she said, I have plenty of money. I don't need you to do this. She had tried like heck to Excuse me. She tried like heck to get into the to the vet here. <laughs> yeah, and she couldn't get into the vet, and she was so frustrated yes. that she couldn't get in that they moved back to Colorado. Oh no! So she could go back to her vet. But you know what she did? <gasps> she donated a thousand dollars. Wow! When she left, and she said, wow. "Please start this fund. It's the Angel Fund for people that can't afford vet care." Wow. So I have that as an option when people want to donate. That's excellent. It was that's very excellent. cool. And she was yeah, just like that's Mary Poppins. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, she Seriously. blew in and blew out. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Who was that masked woman? She was awesome. <laughs> awesome. I've had some really cool people come through the shelter. Yeah. I mean, just super cool people. So you also do nail trims yes. on Wednesdays? Wednesday, and... 2 to 4. Um, it's a $5 a donation, and we do about 60 a, a, a week. Wow. 60 or 70. Wow. We have an awesome volunteer named Elaine. Um, she has a shelter dog from us and a shelter cat from us, and she used to be a groomer. She donates her services. Then wow. we have the rest of our staff. Um, we work with dogs that aren't super friendly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. we get it done. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a it's a necessary service here for for folks in our community. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> my dog's nails are at this point probably an inch long. That's way too long, but they're black, so yeah. I can't tell where the quick is. Yep. Every single time yep. I. Yep. And then it and it's like it bleeds like a sieve. I know. I so know. we we have quick stop and yeah. you know, we we try to take them down slowly, right? So that the quick goes back. But right. yeah, right. That's why I have these nice glasses and I have young people that can, <laughs> can cut the nails. <laughs> yep. So what other services you do? You do vaccine vaccines. You yes. do nail clippings. We have a wellness clinic now, mm-hmm. and I have two doctors. I have Doctor Allen who comes from Snipped. He is the spay and neuter vet there. He does our spay and neuter for us. Um, he is a paid vet here. And we pay for those services, mm-hmm. and then Doctor Nina comes from Doctor Joe's in Cave Junction. Wow. 
Um, Dr. Joe has been in business forever. Mm-hmm. He's a country vet. I, I never met the man in life in, in my life, but I've heard the most amazing, wonderful things about him. Nice. He reminds me of a vet I used to have where if you couldn't afford it, we're going to figure it out. Yep. And that's kind of my opinion when it comes to sheltering animals yeah. as well. If you can't afford something, yeah, let's talk figure to it me. Out. Let's figure it out. Yeah. We'll figure it out. So she comes over once a month now. We used to do it on the third Saturday. We no longer do it on the third Saturday. Dr. Nina gives me a date about a month ahead of time. Mm-hmm. So people will email, we'll get them on the schedule. Right. Uh, we do uh, low, low level wellness, mm-hmm. like um, skin issues. We see a lot of skin allergies here in Brookings, mm. a lot of dogs. Mm with skin allergies. So we do, um, she can prescribe um, some medicines to help with that. We do ear infections, uh, bladder infections, uh, urinary tract, upper respiratory, and then just all of your basic vaccinations. So um, we're kind of getting to the end of our time. Um, How about contact information? How do people get in touch with you? The best way, and I'll tell you why that's the best way, most people have my cell phone at this point. <laughs> Most people do. But the easiest way, and I do answer my emails throughout the day. I check them first time when I get up throughout the day and when I go to bed, uh, southcoasthumane at gmail.com. That is the easiest way. People can Facebook message me, but the email, usually sometimes I'll have like three different combos going on and I'll realize, okay, I Facebooked you, I emailed you, and I talked to you on the phone. So keeping it to the email, <laughs> that's the easiest way for me to go back um, because I get literally hundreds of calls and emails every week. So, so repeat when, the the, e- the email address again. Easy. Southcoasthumane at gmail.com. Got it. And this is the funny one. When someone comes in and it goes, hi, I'm Donna Johnson. I talked to you. I'm like, um, remind me? <laughs> <laughs> Just give me the first, you know, it's kind of like Jeopardy. Just give me a oh, couple yeah. of clues oh, and, then, yeah. and then I'll remember it. Well, if you're getting I'm dozens. the one that called about the kittens. <laughs> That's my favorite one. Yeah. yeah. Or, or they come in and they're carrying a carry case. And I'm like, there better not be kittens in that. Nope. Just returning a carry case. Okay. You're good. <laughs> You've had a lot of kittens. Oh, my goodness. The yeah. kitten season has not stopped and it doesn't appear to stop any anytime soon. I think I read something on, on your site that said they, they have kittens every four months or yes. something, which is like yeah. insane. That's why it's important to get them yeah. fixed. and. Here's, and I know we get, we are very short of time, trap and release. I wish I had a day for just TNR because there are so many people here that have some ferals that they're, mm-hmm. they don't want to stop feeding them. Right. You know, that's kind of cruel. Right. That we want to trap them and release them. But the timing of that, when you, when you don't have a vet that you can go, Hey, I got to get this cat in today. Yeah. So you've trapped this feral. Now what yeah. the hell do we do with it yeah, exactly. until we can get it fixed? Exactly. So I will offer pop-up crates. For them mm. to house the cat until we can get it fixed. Mm. But we can't keep them in the shelter because it's dangerous. Right. You know, for staff and then for the cat as well. Right. All right. So it's uh, South Coast Humane at gmail.com. Your Facebook page is South Coast Humane, the real one. The real one. We got right, hacked. We got hacked. I remember that. Yeah. God. Ridiculous. I'd like to hack them. I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Into little pieces. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Jennifer, it's been absolutely delightful having you here today. I'm I'm thrilled you came in. Um, you might want to consider like having a pet of the week because we'd love to advertise that. So. I will do that. Good. I will. That would be great. And keep in mind, now we have a little satellite cat adoption center out at a thrift store. Oh, perfect. We have two cats at a time that go out and Donna... It's been really good for Donna. She needs a pet therapy. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> and, we've been ad- and sometimes it's overwhelming when you come to the shelter because yep. we have so many. Yep. So when you see two, yeah. you can make a, ch- a choice and a decision. So thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for and having me. And this is Candace Michelle, and it's our community. See you next time.